Hi everyone, this is Pastor Dan for our pastor's devotional this week at Christ Church. Uh, for the scripture today, we'll be looking to a Psalm of David, Psalm uh, 139, uh, beginning with verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You and I are fearfully and wonderfully made, according to God's word here in Psalm 139. Even after all these years of medical and psychological and neurological studies, much of the intricate workings of the whole human person, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, we are a mystery. And yet, we are not a mystery to our Creator. Uh, we're created in His image. David in the psalm here seems to understand that human beings are a miraculous work of God that are complicated in their makeup. And then he turns quickly to the heights of and number of God's thoughts that are too great for us humans to even fathom. Genesis chapters 1 through 3 also tell us the story of how God created humans with great love and care, made in his image, and creations and humans as well were all declared to be good. Yet we know, too, that eventually, later in the story, the human image bearers of God had freedom to use their free will for the good that God intended, or to break away from God's will and pursue their own, even when it meant introducing sin and death to the world. And so, as sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, we, too, carry the capacity for good and for evil and how we would choose to use our free will as well today. Because of the ongoing, unconditional love of God and his covenant with his people through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are never alone in this. We're never beyond his reach to forgive and to save and to grow us in the redeeming work of God. It's always at work in us and in our relationships, and in our world. The brokenness that started with the sins of Adam and Eve are still with us in this struggle to live a life that's centered in God and his good intentions for us in creation. Yet because of God is rich in mercy, abounding in love, because of his presence and his grace always being with us, we also carry this potential to grow beyond our sinful habits that are destructive towards ourselves uh, and others around us as well. The New Testament contains many lists of virtues and vices for Christians to be aware of. Having such labels is helpful to identify and know the good we should be moving towards and the sins and evil that we should be working against or trying to leave behind. I suspect for each of us, there are some virtues that come easier for us than for others. And likewise, there are some vices that are easier to avoid for us than for others. Such as the uniqueness of persons who are created wonderfully and fearfully in the image of God. Yet all of us, however unique we may be, are called to grow in Christ and to bear his image more fully to the to people and the world as time goes on. Early on in the Christian church, as well as in the centuries that followed, Christians have sought to help break out of the patterns of sin and brokenness in their lives with the truth of Scripture 
the grace of God and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. In the 300s to 400s AD, some of the early Christian leaders found common wisdom as they counseled others toward growth in Christ with this observation, that many had the presence of certain basic virtues, uh, that they were also often accompanied by certain basic vices in these uh, typical pairings, if you will. In a similar way, we've heard it said ourselves that our greatest strength is often our greatest weakness. And so eventually, there were three groups of three pairings of virtues and vices that were commonly found in people who were coming to seek uh, Christian counseling, making a total of nine basic uh, pairings or categories or types. The word used for this paradigm was Enneagram, which just means the number nine. These nine numbers, one through nine, represented a stronger than usual tendency towards a particular Christ-like virtue, as well as a tendency towards a particular sin. In the early church from the 300s forward, many Christians have been helped and gained victory in their lives over deep-rooted sinful patterns in their lives through Christian counseling with awareness of the Enneagram model of virtues and vices in view. In recent decades, since about the 1980s forward, and especially in the last few years, there has been a resurgence of interest in the Enneagram. Uh, you may have heard it or seen it in various places. In this more recent time frame, uh, much of the field of modern psychology has been added to or built on the foundation of the original nine categories or pairings of virtues and vices. While it was originally intended for Christian growth and transformation in the church, it has become quite popular in the secular world as well in fields such as personality typology, team building and business settings, and clinical therapy. Within the church, it's becoming a more commonly used paradigm by Christian counselors, therapists, and spiritual directors. There are some variations in how the Enneagram model is taught, depending on the teacher's own viewpoints today. Uh, while I don't totally agree with all that is taught about the Enneagram model today, I do believe when you stick to just the nine basic virtue and vice pairings, it is a helpful model for those who are wanting to be more self-aware in how these uh, one or two or three of these nine uh, patterns are evident in their life and how they can seek Christ and transformation and overcome those things that are obviously uh, a weight and a burden to us in our Christian lives. Probably uh, more than anything else, the best-selling book, The Road Back to You by Episcopal priest and psychiatrist Ian Morgan Cron has moved the Enneagram model into popular culture in the last few years. If you're looking to learn more about what the basic model of the Enneagram really is, reading that book is a great introduction that gives you a brief and entertaining description of the nine types and the traditional model. Personally, while I think there is a lot of there's a lot to the individual nine pairings of vices and virtues found in scripture, they can be helpful for greater uh, self-awareness and intentional spiritual growth when we can uh, test and assess what's really present in our hearts and our thinking and our lives and our behavior. There are other aspects of the traditional Enneagram model, which I'm a little uh, reluctant to embrace or reserving judgment upon. For example, the common picture of the Enneagram model has lines that connect each of the nine numbers with two others. Uh, that indicate behaviors that might be borrowed from other numbers when the person is under stress or in a peaceful and safe environment. Here's a picture of it here. You can see the, um, the, nine, uh, the nine numbers and those lines that connect them. And the, the vices are not listed there. It's just the virtues 
Uh, so you'd have to look deeper to, to get to know the full model. Um, but, but I think, um, um, I think people can have strong tendencies actually for more than one number that may not fit a typical pattern. And that's why I think it's really best to process uh, Enneagram, Enneagram test results uh, that come from a self uh, rating assessment survey with a Christian counselor or a spiritual director uh, who has recommended the test and is familiar with it and can help process not just one number, but what your results were across all of those nine numbers, both in the positive aspects of it and the negative. Um, so if any of this makes you curious about how the Enneagram model for spiritual formation might help you to grow in Christ, I'm happy to speak with you further about it or refer you to other books on it that are uh, particularly those that are written by uh, Christian spiritual directors. Uh, here's one by Alice Freiling called uh, Mirror for the Soul, a Christian guide uh, to the Enneagram. Um, that has some helpful things that are uh, with not only things that are moving towards health, but uh, things that are rooted in the spiritual language of our tradition and uh, scriptures. Uh, so to bring it back to the scripture we started with uh, that was written by King David so long ago, we are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. It is not easy to come to a greater self-awareness of all the good and positive aspects of ourselves that are there because we're created good and in the image of God. We also it's not easy to grow in self-awareness of the negative aspects or the unhelpful patterns that come from uh, our own personal brokenness and sin. The scriptures call us, though, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ on a personal level. Growing on purpose in this way does require some courage and some work on our part to both reflect on the truth of the scriptures as well as self-reflection self upon how those scriptures and truths are being made manifest in our daily choices and lives and relationships. I have found the Enneagram to be a helpful tool that has helped me in that direction and challenges me to not be complacent in my life in Christ, uh, but to push on for the growth, even the, the tough growth that involves acknowledging uh, there are things that I need to work on. So thank you for listening today. Uh, please let me know if, uh, you, if I can help you in resources or learning more in this area and pray that you all have a blessed day today. Bye-bye.